Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to another bonus episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where we bring you conversations with experts in fields relating to urban farming and dive a little deeper into some of the important issues of our time. Healthy food is something everybody wants. Delicious and nutritious and right outside your own door is even better. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or visit IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Today in this bonus episode, we are with Jake Mace for our Ask Jake and Greg show where we chat about gardening and fruit trees and answer some pressing questions. So, sir, what are you up to in your garden these days? I always like to start there. Yeah, I'm planting the fall garden because in the Phoenix area, I think also with Southern California and Texas and Las Vegas, we can garden kind of all fall, all winter and all spring long. So it's like one Mm -hmm. big giant season. Yeah. So I'm starting to prep. I mean, it literally was 110 degrees in my garden today, September 12th. It was 111 yesterday. Oh (laughs) my gosh. I mean, my avocado trees, my bananas, and all my garden is like, when is it going to dip below 100, please? Because this is the first summer. I never, I didn't cover anything with shade cloth this summer for the first time. Oh, wow. But it looks like this coming week after tomorrow, it's going to be in the 90s for at least the next 15 days. Oh, really? Oh, that's nice. That's what the weather report says, yeah. Oh, nice. It doesn't, however, mean that it's going to get below 100 yet. I mean, next week it will, but we're not done with 100s yet. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, you mean like, yeah, sure. So I'm just prepping my raised beds one at a time for uh-huh. the fall garden. And for me, it's difficult to prep the beds because I, I tend to video everything for my vegan athlete channel. Oh, yeah. YouTube. So it's difficult to garden, not because gardening is that difficult, because it's difficult to record yourself all the time. So, oh, yeah. But I do like to look back at my YouTube channel like a video journal because people think that the YouTube videos I put on there are for them, but they're actually for me because I can look back. I've got over 400 videos there now. I can look back at any stage of my gardening journey and I can kind of see what I look like and my garden looked like along the way. Yeah. So I'd recommend folks out there, if you're going to garden, definitely take pictures, take video because it will keep you motivated to garden and consistency with gardening is key like anything, like working out Mm -hmm. at the gym eating healthy food, consistency is key. So sometimes doing a little video or some pictures keeps you in it and keeps you gardening to your best every day. Yeah. And I have dozens of hours of video on my computer that I've never done anything with because I don't have the desire to actually do the editing like you do. (laughs) That's That's the hardest part. Oh, I know. I know. I record the stuff and then it's like, yeah, I don't know that I have the energy to do anything with it. (laughs) You know, so right right now what I'm doing is I actually just got done doing the most important thing you can do if you want to be a successful gardener. And right now I'm doing the second most important thing you can do if you want to be a successful gardener. Two things are, okay, number one, this is my opinion. So number one, the most important thing you can do if you want to be a successful gardener is get into hiking and backpacking in the forest, whatever forest you live in. Ah, yes. Because if you're just living in the city and you're just talking to farmers and other gardeners, you're just kind of isolated. You need to go learn from the best gardener in the world, which is mother nature in the forest. Mm -hmm. And when you go on a two-day backpacking trip or a one-day hiking trip or a multi-day camping trip, you learn how the ground looks. You learn what happens when leaves fall and bark falls and trees Mm -hmm. fall down. You learn about how close trees can be planted together and how the little plants grow underneath the canopies of the bigger plants and the trees. And you, you come back with all this gardening knowledge that inherent in you because you were immersed in this gardening culture called the forest and called mother nature. Yeah. So I just got done last weekend on a three day, over 30 mile backpacking trip in Northern Arizona. And I'm coming back here ready to garden with all these new skills inspired by mother earth. Sweet. Sweet. Have you started planting? Now you plant from seeds, right? I do a little bit of both. I think it's powerful to plant from seeds. And Mm -hmm. I've been planting every month the seeds from my seed bank box from Mm -hmm. seedbankbox.com. Yep. I also like to support any kind of seeds out there that are heirloom or open pollinated seeds. I think heirloom and open pollinated seeds is much more valuable than organic seeds. Because here's my thought. If you get an organic a quote unquote organic seed and grow it in miracle grow chemical fertilized soil, that plant's no longer organic. That plant is tainted. Yeah. But if you take a non organic seed and plant it in the most organic, incredible soil with worm castings and rock dust and compost, then that seed will grow in those conditions and be much healthier. So I would say to gardeners out there, look for the heirloom varieties of seeds. Look for the open pollinated because those are the ancient 
seed that humans have been growing organically for hundreds and hundreds of years. So look for that word, heirloom or open pollinated. Open and, pollinated. Um, yeah. I also love going in my city, wherever city you guys live in, and find a local grower of gardening plants. Don't go support the big box store, support a local person. So go find a local nursery or a local grower. Grower. Yeah. And and buy their plants. So you're planting plants from a local person or the seeds that are heirloom or organic or open pollinated. Yeah. That's it. Well, the the cool thing is when you buy seeds and then if there are heirloom or open pollinated, basically what that means, those two terms are almost synonymous. It basically means when you plant that seed and you save the seed after it's gone to seed, you will get the same plant that you started with. Exactly. Yeah. So that's one of the tricks that I do here at the Urban Farm is I've been planting with heirloom seeds here for 15 or 20 years, and I have multiple things that are growing in my yard that I didn't plant this year or last year or the year before or the year before. There's nasturtiums and basil and lettuce, garlic, onions. Probably uh, beans. Bean, oh, yeah, yeah, cow peas. They come back year after year. I'm trying to think what else. That, oh, parsley, man. I get Every winter, I get a parsley forest here. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and it just, it just comes back year after year. And that goes back to your forest conversation that you were ha- talking a little while ago. It's nobody tends a forest. Things just grow. So what exactly. if you created your yard? And I know you're doing this, Jake. I've been doing it for a couple of decades now. What if you created your yard to be like a food forest. That is exactly what I'm trying to do. Yeah. You know what, well, Greg, I, This is very interesting to me. For some reason, I think Mercury is in retrograde or something's happening with the universe. Maybe that uh-huh. solar eclipse or something's happening where I'm getting a lot of hate lately on my YouTube videos. Really? Yeah. For I'm getting gardening? Of, for the gardening, especially for the the gardeners have been, have been angry lately. <laughs> oh, interesting. And I've been getting a lot of hate comments just about a lot of stuff. And one recently was about how Jake is really, you know, they use a lot of foul language. I'm going to clean it up for your podcast. I mean, like a lot of F word and a lot of SH word and that sort of stuff. Huh. And they were saying how I really am not very good at gardening. I'm just good at growing fruit trees. Oh. And I wanted, I, I wanted to say to them, have you not watched my videos and seen <laughs> forests of kale and cucumbers and, and basils and herbs and vegetables and tomatoes and that I've been pulling out of my garden? And yes, I grow fruit trees, and they're very important because they are the top layer oh, canopy yeah. of the food forest. Well, they're the middle layer. Or the, the top layer is your mesquites and that's what I other mean, yeah. things. Yeah. Sure. But I mean, just the trees in general are the, parent, are, the, are the parents and the microclimate producers for the garden. Yeah. So really, if, really, 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 really important. Important. And so if you're a, somebody who just has a garden, you've only done half the work. You need to put in some fruit trees and some native trees. Yeah. That will help to insulate that microclimate that you're trying to create, which is what Greg just mentioned, a food forest. You have to create yeah. a food forest in your backyard and your front yard. Yeah. And Greg, and you've you done know, that at the urban farm. I have. I have. And you know what? I want to speak to what you were saying there about you don't know how to grow. First of all, I know you know how to grow that stuff because I've seen it. However, you know, I knew you five years ago when you didn't really know how to grow anything. So I've been actually, I've been gardening for 41, 42 years now. Right. Here in the desert. And, you know, I've experienced a lot, but what I really want to acknowledge you for is you've only been doing it for five years. And I saw pictures of your yard five years ago and it was a flat dirt area. And what you've done in in the past five years is absolutely amazing. In fact, I think one time recently I told you when I was there that your gardening space is the most amazing gardening space that I've seen here in Phoenix. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, just people are going to be grumpy now because of, for whatever reason, but we just need to get back to gardening, get your hands back in the dirt and garden, baby garden. Exactly. And that brings us to the second most important thing I think is for gardening successfully. Great. Number one was go to the forest, go to the forest and spend time in the forest. Yep. Number two, not just once in a while, all the time. Like when you guys have a free weekend, go in the forest. Number two is eat healthy vegan food or plant-based food in its raw state. I always say in my videos, I'm the vegan athlete. So of course I'm going to tell you to go vegan because I am the vegan athlete, right? Yeah. Not everybody is going to go vegan, but even if you're not going to go vegan, go get plant-based food in its raw state and try to have at least one meal a day that's totally raw, whether it's your fruits, or your vegetables, or your grains, your seeds, yep. and your nuts. Because like right now, while I'm doing this podcast with you, I'm eating one of my favorite snacks, which is I got a bowl of raspberries, mangoes, and banana. 
Ooh. With pure coconut <sighs> milk and coconut cream all over it. Oh, nice. And I got some pure. That's what I hear you slurping on, baby. It is. And I got pure, hundred <laughs> percent pure maple syrup on top of that to make it kind of sweet. And oh, nice. Yeah. So now what's happening is I'm encouraged to go grow my own mangoes and grow my own bananas and my own raspberries and my own maple syrup tree. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So even though I can't grow raspberries in Phoenix very well, it's hard to do that. But at least I'm eating food, so my taste buds are getting used to a really healthy a, a healthy diet. Yeah. And therefore, that will encourage me to grow more of that raw plant-based food in my garden. Because if you're just growing as a hobby, you'll never really lean on your garden. If you're growing for your for your food bill to go for down, your for your sustenance, for your health, yep. you're going to lean more game. on your garden. And you'll mm-hmm. yeah, you'll you'll put that extra ten percent mm-hmm. into your garden game. Yeah. Ten percent or fifty percent or a hundred percent. Right. This is exactly why I call it urban farming and not urban gardening, because gardening is a hobby and farming is a job. Correct. And when we when we're doing a job, that's you know we're we're putting more energy behind it. That's why that is the whole reason. And thanks for bringing that up. That's the whole reason I talk about the difference between urban farming and urban gardening. So, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. So. I have some really exciting news to share. Go ahead. So I had some friends stop by the other day, and there was a little five-year-old with them. His name was Jude. Yeah, his name was Jude. And he looked up into my tree, and he said, what's that? And I looked up. I hadn't looked up because this is, this is a 15-foot-tall fruit tree in my yard. I hadn't looked up in this 15-foot-tall fruit tree in the past few days. And what was hanging there? A ripe papaya. That's awesome. I ate my first papaya off of my first papaya tree here ever at the urban farm. That's awesome. Yeah. And you had planted that papaya as like a little six inch little seedling, right? Or as a seed, maybe. Not as a seed. I bought it at the Arizona Rare Fruit Growers sale here a year, almost two years ago. And I know if, if you did that, then you bought from my friend, Dr. David Rosenberg, who probably grew yep. that in, in Paradise Valley, which is right next to Phoenix. Yeah. So yeah, that, exactly. that papaya for sure was probably grown from seed all the way in the Phoenix area. Yes. About 15, 16 feet tall. The trunk on it's got to be a good eight inches diameter. This thing is a tree. Wow. Yeah. Very excited about that. Very excited about that. So I think I didn't want to say this at first because I wasn't sure if they'd work, but I'm finding that papayas grow very well in the Phoenix area. Yeah. Now they do. I tried growing them 10 years ago and it was too cold in the winter. They froze back. Wow. Yeah. And I, that's what happened to me. The first year I grew papayas, I had that freeze that knocked mm-hmm. all the leaves off. But since yep. then, they've been growing great. Yeah. Well, this one won't freeze back. The top might freeze, but the, the trunk's not going to freeze. It's, it's thigh size or bigger. It's huge. That's awesome. So are you ready for some questions there, Jake? I'm ready. Catherine says, I'm attending the gardening chat on the 12th. Oh, that's tonight. Yay, Catherine. I have my fruit trees ordered and will soon be digging my holes for them to check for drainage soil type and finding wood chips. What can I do be doing over the next few months to make sure I have my soil optimal and full of nutrients for my future trees to thrive? You want to go first or you want me to go first? You want me to go first? I can answer a few things and then maybe you can answer a few things too. Go. Okay, so number one is I would walk around your yard and pick the right climate for the trees that you ordered from Greg's urban fruit tree program. Mm -hmm. Because you might not want to put an orange tree in the hottest and most liquid hot magma corner of your yard. (laughs) You (laughs) You might want to put a native tree there, like a native tree that can help to shade the orange tree. Mm -hmm. And then number two is I would, once you know where you want each tree, I would mark those spots and dig the holes now. Yeah, and dig the holes and fill them with the soil that you're going to use for the tree. And I use a soil that I call Mesa's Mix. It's just a simple soil that involves the native clay, some sand, some compost, some worm castings, and rock dust and mycorrhiza. And Greg will have this soil available at his urban fruit tree pop-up, pop-up nursery coming up. Yep. I would fill the hole with that with that that mix, and then water the hole with the soil in it once a week. And that way the hole will become alive. And when you put your fruit tree in it, it will already have three or four months of living organisms in it. Yeah. And then what I would definitely make sure you do is get the shade cloth ready 
so that come April, end of April, early May, you can put like a 30 to 50% shade over those fruit trees for the first summer or the second summer in Phoenix yeah. um, because we had the most brutal summers on the planet. <laughs> and they're getting worse. And they're getting worse. So that's, those are my tips, Greg, and I would say take it away. And also get, get, as much, get as many bags of leaves and as much wood chips and mulch as you can right now mm-hmm. and serve one corner of your yard and just make an enormous pile of wood chips and leaves and mulch because yeah. you're going to need all that mulch and leaves to put on top of the soil for those fruit trees to be happy just like the forest yeah so this is what i've been suggesting for people given they don't necessarily have access to potting soil and all of our amendments get some wood chips find wood chips somewhere either get a truckload i know that the the home stores have bags of wood chips that you can buy nothing treated dig your hole dig your hole and then put the wood chips in the hole and water them so they'll start breaking down over the course of the next few months into soil and you know basically it's doing the same thing we're basically building nice healthy soil in that area and if you are you have block walls around and gravel around you need to do your best to mitigate that heat i've got a class that i'm doing tomorrow night called three ways to kill your fruit trees and in that class i have a bunch of pictures that people have been sending me about what they you know their successes and failures around it and the most consistent piece is that the people that put six to eight inches of woody mulch in an area that is much bigger than the fruit tree all around to cool the space. Those are the people that are being more successful. Where can they attend that that fruit tree class? That is online. If you go to urbanfarm.org tonight on the front page, on the right, there is a sign up link for the class for tomorrow night and it's you know it's just like this although i'll have slides that will that will flip through tonight we just have our placeholder slide that says welcome to our monthly chat with jake and greg so i'll actually have slides that will process through and you'll be able to see people that have done things that have killed fruit trees and people that have done things that have successfully grown fruit trees in the desert and there are three very very consistent things that people do that when they're paying attention to them they're successful and when they're not paying attention to them they're yeah not so successful you know greg it's like anything in life like two people can both put one hour into gardening or two people Uh two people can both put one hour into working out at the gym but get totally different results if they are in it or, or not so if you've got if you're just putting in the time into your garden you need to actually put in a little bit of expertise as well and that's why it's important yeah. to get with a gardener who's already successfully doing it yeah and steal some of their knowledge and apply it toward your one hour of work a day in your garden or if you're putting three hours yeah. or whatever yeah take classes you know we do jake and i do these once a month bill and i do these uh, seed chat once a month we do classes free classes online we have courses that you can take at urban farm U. so you we have have to continue to improve our knowledge about this. This is how we get good at it, at anything. Exactly. All right. Jackie says, please talk about depth for planting. We've been told to plant at the level the tree was in the pot. So even, she says, even if bare root, you can, you can see the depth it has been at. But lately I'm reading and hearing to plant with the root ball at the surface and the flare above the roots just showing. I wouldn't plant the flare I don't know that I know exactly what Jackie's talking about on the flare part. You need to make sure that all of the roots are covered. And what, here's what I tell people to do with planting trees. You want to put a five to eight inch basin of woody mulch around your tree. So if you have to lift that tree and plant it on a on a hill in the middle of the basin, then that's what we do. So that the graft point, that's the most important thing. The graft point has to, has to, has to be above your soil level. This absolutely has to do that. If the, if that if you plant that graph point underneath the soil level, you're going to kill the tree. So that's Jackie for me. And, and I'll have lots of information coming out over the next three months about planting depth and like that. We're rewriting our fruit tree planting manifesto from last year to make it much, much more in depth. Thoughts on that, Jake? Yeah, the same. I mean, what I do is I don't mind when I'm planting a fruit tree that already came in a pot from the nursery or from mm-hmm. wherever you got it from, right? The tree's already in a pot and you're going to put it from the pot in, into the ground. I don't mind having a little bit of root showing because just like what Greg says, I'm going to be covering all those roots with so much mulch. Yeah, I'm not covering the roots and I'm not covering the trunk of the tree with like hard, compact clay. I'm maybe leaving a couple, like a little bit of the roots showing, but then all that gets covered with mulch and leaves and grass 
and all the different kinds of wood chips so that everything's covered and it will break down over time. I found that it's very difficult to suffocate a tree with wood chips and mulch. It's easy to suffocate a tree with hard compact clay. Oh yeah. So, you know, put the mulch there, man. I mean, I I'm just telling you guys, the mulch and the wood chips, don't neglect it. It really is key. When you go into the forest, you're going to see mulch and pine needles and leaves and bark everywhere. Do it like Mother Nature does it and do it in your garden too. And do it lots. And do yeah, it more I than cannot. you think. You, you think. know what? I just shake my head. This year, do you know how much we've screamed over the past three, year, three years about adding woody mulch around our trees? Greg, the first, I, I took your class on rainwater harvesting. I went to your Five tour years and I, ago. I still didn't use mulch for the first year and a half. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many pictures of half dead fruit trees or dead fruit trees I've been getting over the last three months from people saying, well, what's wrong with my trees? And in the background is a block wall and all around the tree is gravel and they have a 18 inch basin of woody chips around the tree exactly i've gotten so many pictures just like that it's like don't do it you know we just have to scream about this every time we're on the phone and i'm sorry if you guys are some of you are getting tired of hearing it but i'm still getting the photographs saying what's wrong with my trees and you know they have like a half inch of woody mulch in a basin that's 18 inches wide greg and what not is, to promote not to promote all my own stuff but i have this urban gardening arizona facebook page. group yeah it's approaching 30,000 members. I saw that. It's a private group. And the power of that is that I'm the admin of the group and I get to see everybody. It's run by the members. Everybody puts yeah. their gardening pictures on there. And still yep. to this day, yep. people, people post pictures of their newly planted tree with like a donut of a berm around the tree like they're supposed to. Yep. But then it's just clay and there's like a little bit of wood chips, like a handful thrown in the middle. And I'm going, have you guys not watched a video or heard a podcast or taken a class because you need to have mulch and wood chips everywhere. Yeah, so I'm on your Facebook page. I'm actually on the Facebook group, Facebook group right now looking, at, and I, I flip through it occasionally and answer some people's questions. Ellen posted there, she got a fig tree today, and it's a brown turkey. She says, wish me luck, and then an advice. So it's actually, uh -huh. sitting, it's actually sitting in a gravel part of her yard. I'm going to go there and look at it too. For the first thing, Ellen, the gravel needs to go away. And so I did, I did say, you know what, gravel needs to go away. And she said, thanks, Greg. I was thinking I would leave them on the patio for a few more weeks. So the other thing is you do not want to pot a, put a plant, a tree in the ground right now mm. because they're just going to roast. Here's what I tell people to do, and you'll hear this tomorrow night in my class as well. Go out, especially this time of year. Stand in that area where you're going to plant this tree for the next two hours or for two hours on a Tuesday afternoon and see if you would want to live in that space. And then look around to see what you can do to mitigate some of that heat. How right. can you you shade it? Can you plant a mesquite tree that's going to, or a palo verde or, or an ironwood that's going to grow up and create shade for the space? Can you put up shade cloth for the first two years? Definitely, if you're planting, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Jake. In fact, I'm, say, I'm changing this as we speak, literally. If you're going to plant in a gravel yard and there is gravel within seven, six, seven, eight feet of that tree, it's likely you're going to cook it. So exactly. when, when we say basins around these trees, you know, six foot diameter basin, seven foot diameter basin, eight foot diameter basin. In fact, I have a guy, I've got pictures for class tomorrow night where he took his gravel front yard. I have a before and after picture. And he said, Greg, this is when I planted them in January. And this is what they look like in June. And he went from gravel to a, you know, he's getting his food forest in and the trees were thriving in June. Right. So, you know, I'm sorry if for those of you that hear me scream about woody mulch, but more and more and more woody mulch. And you have to add it every year because it breaks down into this great soil. And the woody mulch, here's what the woody mulch does. It creates a, a sponge effect. So it holds on to water. In fact, interestingly enough, you got a foot of woody mulch in some of your places and you don't ever water it. Right, Jake? Exactly. Today I was at my garden and I was marveling at one part of my garden. I was watching the the iPhone unveil today on the Apple site live on YouTube. <laughs> right. And I was watering a tree at the same time and I was sitting enjoying the shade of my tropical area of my corner of my garden. Uh -huh. And I've got one area where there's two feet of wood chips there. Haven't yep. seen water in two, three weeks since it rained last. And I yeah. lifted up a leaf just to look at it while I'm watching the YouTube. And on the bottom part of the leaf, there was condensation droplets yep. all over the leaf. Yep. How is that's that possible what... when water hasn't hit that spot in weeks because the wood chips is a sponge that holds that yep. moisture? Yeah. So the wood chips are a sponge that hold the moisture. It's an insulation layer, keeping the space insulated. And first and foremost, it is creating amazing healthy soil. Correct. Underneath. So that's the reason. So I'm, uh, I'm done with my rant. <laughs> so shall we go on to the next question? Sure. 
All right, cool. So I'm just opening these in my questions at urbanfarm.org account, and I'm just going to read them. I have no idea what they can, what they say. So Carol says, we have only lived here for a year, so lots of other things have taken preference besides growing things. But now I'm wanting to start. I heard somewhere you can that you can Google our yard, and maybe we send you pictures to get help when when on when and where to plant things. So I do that, Carol. It's called a phone consult. If you go to store.urbanfarm.org and scroll down a little bit, there's a phone consultation tab and you can purchase a phone consult there. It's really simple the way they work. You send me your address and about a half a dozen photographs of your yard. Here's the thing. I've been doing them for six or seven years this way. They're much more effective, believe it or not, than me coming out. And I guarantee them, if you're not happy ecstatically happy with the amount of data that you gain from our conversation, I'll give you your money back. And we basically chat on the phone for 45 minutes about what's going on in your space. And I kind of do some coaching, you know, coaching for you about what, how, where, what to do with the space, you know, how to plant nurse trees and so on and so on. So that's what I do. Do you do anything like that, Jake? I had a wait list that was so long I had to stop because honestly, Mm -hmm. I'm just doing so much with video production right now with my YouTube channel and my online school at my website, jakemace.com. Yeah. I just can't, I don't have time for the consults right now. I, I had a wait list yeah. that was so long and I was even charging like $400 an hour and still getting people that right. were signing up for it. So I just don't have the yeah. time. Maybe someday well, I were... will, but right now I'm, I'm loving the video because I can reach millions of people. We're, we're about to hit right. 9 million views on my YouTube channel. Congratulations, yeah. dude. This is mostly about gardening, by 85% yeah. about gardening. Wow, nice. Nice, nice, nice. But anyway. you were going out to see people, right? I was. And even some yeah. things I was like acquiring like 10 or 20 date palms that would go out and I would plant the people's houses for them and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's the challenge because here's the thing. If I meet with somebody on the phone, it costs me 45 minutes. If I have to go out to their house, it costs me four or five hours from the time exactly. I leave here Greg, to the time I get back. And it just, nobody that understands happens. that but you and me. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's the reason we don't make home visits. And that's the reason that I do these these garden consults. They promise you, promise you, promise you, you will learn so much. All right, next question. Jessica says, my daughter Natalie, six, and I, Jessica, are here listening. Yay, welcome. We are making a raised garden in our backyard and wondering if you know where we can order a truckload of soil to be delivered. We live in Chandler. So let's start with that one, Jake, because that that goes right to your mace garden mix. Yeah. So Natalie, <clears throat> there there is a product that's okay. It's a little bit woody for my, you know, for my taste, but it'll work. I'm working on other another solution, but for right now, today, you know, September 2017, you want to call Western Organics and get their premium potting soil blend of soil. You can order it by the truckload. Their phone number is 602-269-5757. That's in the Phoenix area, Phoenix metropolitan area. You get their just tell them that you want what Greg Peterson from the Urban Farm gets. They give you a discount for that. They will deliver five yards out to you. So, and it's usually about $35 a yard, $34, $35 a yard. So that's one way to do it. But that's only half of the story. The other half of the story is, is that you want to add some nutriment some nutrients, some stuff to the top. And for that, we're going to turn it over to Jake because he's going to tell you about his Jake Mace mix that you add to the top layer that will just invigorate your garden. Yeah. So what was this person's name again, Greg? Jessica and Natalie. Jessica and Natalie, you know, if I was doing a brand new raised bed, I have at least five videos on this exact subject on my Vegan Athlete YouTube channel. But if I was going to do a raised bed, I got the raised bed sitting there and let's say it's two feet tall. The bottom of the raised bed, I do the straight compost and I get it from Greg Source from Western Organics. Yeah. And that's actually, let me, for correction, it's actually not straight compost. It's their premium potting soil. Which, which has, has all the extra stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's got extra stuff in it. That's It's good for the base up to about what, six inches from the top, eight inches I, from the top. Yeah. I would say, you know, you got to think if I usually, I usually go about a foot from the top. Oh, okay. Because I figured that it's like a tomato plant's roots are going to go about a foot down. Yeah. So what I do is I fill it up halfway with that straight mix of compost. Or if you're in an area that's not Phoenix, just find some local person who's producing compost. And sometimes yeah. Craigslist is the best option because a lot of these compost type people, they advertise on Craigslist. And I would definitely go to your local source for compost. hmm because that way it's alive still. When you say compost, compost is a very specific thing. Compost is composted down organic matter and it's really dense. 
So that's the reason that we use the bagged products that are like the premium potting soil because they add some other things. They add some, a little bit of woody mulch to it. Not, you know, not a great amount, but a little bit. They add vermiculite to it. They add, you know, some other things to help fluff it up. That's very different than straight compost. Right. And then what I would do is once you've got the, that, the bottom half of your raised bed with that in it, the top half of your raised bed is where you want all the magic to happen. And what I mean by all the magic to happen is you want all the nutrients in there for your, for your plant. And what I do is the top half or the top foot, let's say the top foot and a half top foot is I put a combination of compost, a combination of worm castings, a combination of rock dust and a combination of coconut piss or coconut peat or coconut core. And I get the coconut blocks from A and P nursery here in the Phoenix area. Any A and P mm-hmm. nursery's got them. But Greg, if you guys want to go get it from Greg, I know you've got the coconut at your pop up in the spring, right? Yeah, but that won't be until January. Yeah. Okay. So if you want to do it right now, A and P nursery's got it for like nine ninety nine or ten bucks. They also have an organic bag of worm castings, which is like a oh, fifteen yeah. pound bag for twelve bucks. Yep. And if you want the rock dust, I would say go to jakemace.com and get like a $10 bag of rock dust. But if you want it, I think my friend Seamus O'Leary also does rock dust and worm castings now. And he's locally producing his worm castings now. Ah, very good. So there's a little shout out to Seamus O'Leary. But I would say <clears throat> you want to combine those four things. So the coconut core keeps the moisture in your soil yes. and allows it to stay a bit fluffy so it won't get too compact and suffocate your plant's roots. The coconut core doesn't have a lot, doesn't, does not have nutrition in it. It's just for the moisture and the fluffiness. The worm castings is like a multivitamin for your plant. That's the, that's the nutrition and so is the compost. And the rock dust is the minerals, putting minerals back in your compost that your mm-hmm. bones, your eyes, your organs, your muscles become cavemen like again, meaning strong and healthy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because the food that we're eating, even if it's organic and it's from the organic part of the grocery store, it was probably grown in soil that's got hardly any minerals left in it, which is why everyone's yeah. need to get everyone's getting sick lately. Everybody's getting the need to take multivitamins. Put the minerals back in your soil with the rock dust. And I do those four things, and then I put the seeds and the plants in there, and that has been my secret soil mix that has made my plants grow amazingly well. And what I'm getting to this time of the year is like what Greg's talking about, where my garden just grows plants without me doing anything because the seeds of previous years are laying their dormant in my soil. And as long as my water turns on once a day, those seeds germinate at exactly the right time of year when the weather is perfect. So like in about a month from now, I'll have like a bunch of celery and dill and a bunch of leafy greens, mizuna and Swiss chard and beets just popping up on their own Yeah, because my soil is so fluffy and nutrient dense, the seeds and the garden is a living thing that just grows every season on its own. Mm -hmm. Yay. There you have it. So I also have some exciting news about on this topic, Jake. Sure. That I wanted to share with everybody. So, you know, tanks, do you know tanks down in Tucson? No, I don't know them. They're a recycling organization. And a few years back, they started growing compost, growing soil. And I have contracted with them to create a garden and tree planting mix. Cool. Are you, are you ready for this? Go so it's going it. to have, you're going to love this, tanks, organic compost in it. So they're organic compost. They have this, they found this unending supply of composted pine, which is just wonderful. It's not, it's so composted that you really can't see that it's wood anymore. Really? They're putting organic cocoa, cocoa core in it. So it's going to have the cocoa core built into it and horticultural perlite. And this wow. is what, we, this is what we'll have at our nursery for planting your trees in and planting your gardens in. So then all you have to do at that point is add worm castings and add your uh, rock dust and you're, you know, you're ready to go. So we'll have that. We'll have that available at the nursery in January. That's awesome. I'm I'm going to come get some. Very good. Called the Urban Farm and Greg's Tree and Planter planting mix so oh here's the other cool thing it, we're looking to see how to get it here in bulk so people can come and get it by the truckload that's awesome yeah all right cool so there you go jessica also says jessica and natalie also says also what would you say is a must in planting and taking care of a raised bed wow just one thing that that that's a must <laughs> Well, and I think that one must is putting, getting the soil right. Because literally, yeah. if you don't get the soil right, if you use a, you know, a mulch in there that, you know, Tempe has this great mulch, but it's not for growing groceries in. If you put mulch in there, if it's too woody, it goes in. It'll literally slow you down two years. So if you go cheap, 
and put inexpensive stuff in this bed, it's going to take at least two years for your garden to process through to get great soil in it. Right. And it may discourage you in so much that you stop altogether. So the you know, biggest Greg, thing... I got to tell you, though, the one mistake please. I made when I first started doing my raised beds uh-huh. is I listened to somebody else's opinion. And somebody said, just use just use manure. It'd be so good for your raised bed. Oh, so went, my God, no. <laughs> no, listen to what I did. I, I got a huge, I made a huge raised bed. I call it the living wall right now. It guards my pool from the rest of my yard. And I grow a ton of stuff in it. Right. And I took this raised bed. It's kind of shaped like a smiley face. It's a very, very long, probably like a 30-foot raised bed, maybe about yep. a foot and a half wide the whole way across maybe about two feet wide and i put the bottom foot just straight horse manure from a local horse yard Uh and the top part had some had some compost and for two years everything i would put in there would just look like it had been fried by the sun because it was so hot i had to end up digging the whole thing out and redoing the whole soil and now it grows fantastic with the mix i told you guys about five minutes ago yeah so like what greg's saying is i lost a year and a half of being discouraged and because I put the wrong soil mix in there. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So, and and from my experience, Mr. Jake Mace and everybody listening out there, the what Jake does in his beds, that is the best thing I've ever seen. I, you know, I, I honestly, Jake, think that's a stroke of brilliance that you did that. <laughs> it's simple, Greg. I don't, I think you're giving me too much credit, but I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, here's where the credit is. You've been screaming about it for, for several years now. You know, sure. it's like, do this in your beds. And when you plant your trees and when you set up your beds, follow the mace mix and your success will come so much faster. I can't say that enough. You know, it goes back to the mulch. I'm okay. So I'm passionate tonight, Um, (laughs) you know, well, because I get tired of people sending me emails and posting on Facebook and saying, oh my God, my trees and my garden struggling. What did I do wrong? And, you know, then you see that. Yeah. All right. I've said it enough. So just follow (laughs) this. Lots of woody mulch around your trees, really great soil in your garden beds and when you plant your trees. Exactly. Jessica also threw, threw in a third question. She said, we also have a fig tree, fig trees that were planted in our side yard before moving in, and the figs aren't growing very large. I don't know whether the figs or the trees are, aren't growing very large. How much water do they need? Anything else? Well, you've been on this whole call. You, you know that you need to rake back the gravel. So here's something. The drip line for a tree is if you imagine that tree as an umbrella, as far as the leaves reach out on the end and then go to the ground, that's what they call the drip line. If the drip line for the tree is less than four feet, you need to put a six foot diameter basin around the trees with lots of woody mulch. If the drip line, if the tree is smaller than that, you need to put a six foot diameter basin around the tree with lots of woody mulch. Correct. That would be my take on it. Jake? You know, and even though a fig tree in the Phoenix area works really well and is very hardy and can take uh-huh. the full sun, yeah. it will do better if it has a parent tree somewhere around it to break yep. up the wind, especially when it's small. I mean, I've got a row of four different varieties of fig trees in one part of my yard, and it's a, a tiger panache fig, a black mission fig, a Diana fig, and a brown turkey fig. And they're all in a row, and they didn't start to grow well until I planted them in that row right against the fence, right underneath my neighbor's ash tree, which gives them some some wind protection yeah, and afternoon shade. And there's still enough sun where the figs can grow into, in, into the light. They're not totally shaded, yep. but they, they grew twice as fast. I would say three times as fast when I finally uh, dug them out of the first location that was dumb of me to plant them in. I put them in the right location. So location, 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 and soil, soil, soil. Those are the two yeah. most important things. And then mulch, yeah. mulch, mulch. Yeah. So, Mr. Jake Mace, we are rounding up our hour here. What do you got up for the next 30 days? Well, I'm slowly starting. I'm a, I'm a big time procrastinator. And usually if you guys follow the Myers-Briggs test, like an, like an INFP like I am, is a big procrastinator. because I need that stress to do things last minute, to do things well. So I'm trying this year to not procrastinate and do one bed here and one bed there. So that by like October, my whole winter garden is ready to go. Yeah. So come next month in October, I'll be planting some garlic and onions, potatoes, and stuff like like that. This mm-hmm. month, I'm planting beets and carrots and what's it called? I'm doing some asparagus in my freezer right now. Oh, yeah. Very some good. kales. Yeah, some hardy kales, some cucumbers, and some beans. And I'm also bringing in two fresh loads of wood chips. I just spread one. I have a second one on the way. Oh, my and God. That way, by next month, I'll have a nice thick layer of wood chips to go into the winter with. And next mm-hmm. weekend, not this weekend, but next weekend, the 23rd and 24th, I'm doing a garden workshop and garden tour of my home garden. 
Garden. If you want to join in, oh. the event is on my Facebook group. There you go. Urban Gardening Arizona. You can join it. There's already going to be like 300 people there, I think. Yeah. Go see Jake's yard. We will also have tours of the urban farm here. I think it's the first weekend. You can check our website, urbanfarm.org. But the first weekend of October, we'll have tours on Fridays and Saturdays. You know what the most yeah. important part of these garden tours are, Greg? I've I find is that Tell people me. come, they they love to just see a normal looking house in the in the city and see what the garden looks like. And some of them might be better gardeners than me. They just want some inspiration and some motivation from another gardening enthusiast. Yeah. Some are beginners and they want to learn how to do it right the first time. So yeah. but what I would say the most important part for me of these garden tours is that when you have your garden on display for a day in front of a lot of people, mm-hmm. it forces me to clean the garden up better than it ever would be cleaned <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> yeah, that's a bonus for you. That's for sure. It is. So I want to thank all the gardeners out there who come to my gardening workshops because you guys forced me to go an extra 10% and get my garden yeah. organized. Because if you guys didn't come over, I wouldn't have any incentive to clean a little bit here and a little bit there. So thank yeah. you for the motivation to get my garden looking good. Yeah, exactly. And the other really important thing about these urban farm, the urban farm tour and longevity garden tour is that it's not a walk through garden tour. In other words, it's not one of those where you get a list and you go get to walk through a garden for 10 minutes. This is a facilitated led tour conversation learning experience where we answer all your questions. We get your your questions answered and it's a learning experience. It's absolutely exactly. a learning experience. And it's and it's led by you, Greg, and, and you're the one who knows the yard and has been gardening this time. So it's like price you're like with the master. Yeah. It's like a there master class. Yeah. There you go. So what we have coming up, we have the Great American Seed Up coming up next Saturday, the next Friday and Saturday, the 22nd and 23rd of September here in Phoenix. And if you imagine walking into a room, this will be a 9,500 square foot room. This room is huge. And we will have about 40 tables with popcorn buckets on them and seeds in those buckets. And so you can walk up to the cucumber table and grab a little Ziploc bag and a business card for the Market More Cucumber Mm -hmm. and grab a scoop, which will probably be a tablespoon in this case. And you grab a tablespoon of seeds and put it in that packet and seal it up and mark it on your list. And guess what? That bag of seeds, which represents about eight to 10 bags, packets of seeds at the, you know, at the home store, will cost you a dollar and 25 cents. That's awesome. So yeah, we've designed, and you've been to them before, Jake, you've been to our, our seed. I've been to, I think I've been to all of them. They're, yeah. they're, they're fantastic. I've been since the first one. Yeah. The energy in the room is palpable and for, literally for 40 bucks, you will be able to buy all of the seeds that you need for the rest of your life because they're all open pollinated. They're all open. They're all non GMO. So basically we teach you how to grow them, how to save them and how to store them so that you can start growing out your own seeds. And yeah. When I first started doing the seed bank box program at seedbankbox.com, mm-hmm. I yeah. got our first box, we got them from your seed. Yeah. And it was the way that you helped us kick off the seed bank box. So thank yeah. you for that. They were great. Yeah, seeds. absolutely. And that's seedbankbox.com. That's a monthly distribution of seeds that is a screaming deal is, you know, I was going to say where, when you go to Greg's seed up, you can go there and get all these varieties of seed and get stocked up for the whole year. But seed bank box is more so you, you pay a little bit and we send it right to your house in a very artistically creative box. And it's a new, like seven to 10 varieties of seeds every month, the mystery box of seeds. You can either save them or put them right in your garden. Dude, where I want to get those. Where do I get them at? Just go to jakemace.com or go to seedbankbox.com. Perfect. If you guys want to come say hi, I'll be at Greg's Seed Up. I'm always there. You always have some new varieties I don't have. So I yeah. want to thank you for organizing that great event. And yeah. it's always great yeah. people. And you even had last year, you had like uh, bulbs of garlic and potatoes, oh, yeah. seed potatoes and stuff. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, unfortunately, our supplier ran out of garlic this year. So we don't have any garlic. He sold out. Oh, wow. Early. Yeah, exactly. So, and for information on the Great American Seed Up, go to greatamericanseedup.org. Any last minute thoughts before we wrap this one, Jake? Yes, I want to say a few things. You know, I say this all the time and it's a broken record, but I'm going to say it right here because it might be somebody hearing it for the first time is I really do believe that two things are happening. One, our vote for our political leaders is getting less and less important every year as corporations get bigger and bigger. Mm Mm-hmm. And I also think that even with the iPhone 10 coming out today, it's got the facial recognition, which is, which kind of scares me because mm-hmm. we're, at what point is a company like Apple going to say, now we're going to embed the hardware into your body? 
and turn us into the Borg. That's coming. And I really think that gardening is a way that you can vote with your dollars because instead of voting for your leaders, if you vote with your dollars, and what I mean by vote with your dollars is vote for yourself. Put the money yeah. into your fruit trees and your garden, your front and your backyard, because not only in your education in your education of gardening too, because not only are you voting with your dollars because you're creating a healthy hobby, you're yeah. creating healthy gardening exercise, being out in the sun and doing physical stuff. You're also growing food that's going to be medicine for you and your family, going to keep you healthy longer and out of the doctor's office as long as possible. And then you're also learning how to become kind of a, a, a modern day, I would say a hippie again, because you're learning how to become one with nature. Don't become one with technology, become one with nature. Mm -hmm. Grow your food at home. Do not put the computer programs inside your body. <laughs> stay natural, stay human, yeah. grow your food at home and vote for yourself and invest your money, not in the big box stores, invest it into your front and your backyard gardens and grow your own food for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I'm not even going to say anything to top that. It was brilliant. Thank you so much for once again joining me this evening, Jake. And as I always like to say, farm out and we will catch you on the flip side. Healthy food is something everybody wants. Delicious and nutritious and right outside your own door is even better. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or visit IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about the seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.